Sometimes the discouragement of the saints and people of God are drawn from their sins, their greater and grosser sins. The peace and quiet of the saints and people of God is many times interrupted by their sins. Oh, says one, I am a man or woman of a rebellious heart. I have so slight a spirit, so unholy and uneven a conversation, that when I reflect upon my heart and life I cannot but be discouraged. I know indeed it is a great evil for a man to labor under a sore temptation or a sad desertion, but were my heart good, my life good, my conversation good, I should not be discouraged, but as for me, I have committed and do commit such and such great sins. Have I not reason and just reason now to be discouraged? No, for discouragement itself is a sin, another sin, a gospel sin. Now my sin against the law is no just cause why I should sin against the gospel. I confess indeed there is much evil in every sin. The least sin is worse than the greatest affliction. Afflictions, judgments, and punishments are but the claws of this lion. It is more contrary to God than the misery of hell. Chrysostom had so great a sense of the evil of it, that when the impress sent him a threatening message, Go, tell her, he said, I fear nothing but sin. And in some respects the sins of the godly are worse than the sins of others, for they grieve the spirit more. They dishonor Christ more. They grieve the saints more. They wound the name of God more. They are more against the love and grace and favor of God than other men's sins are. And the Lord does see the sins of his own people, yea, so far he sees sin in them, that he does chastise and afflict them for it, not only from their sin, but for their sin. And therefore, the apostle says in 1 Corinthians 11.30, speaking of the unworthy receiving of the Lord's Supper, For this cause many are sick and weak among you. And he does not only speak of saints in appearance and in church estate, but of such also as were saints indeed, and therefore, he says, we are judged. We are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. He puts himself in. We are judged that we may not be condemned with the world. Our Savior Christ says in Revelation 3.19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. It seems, then, it was for sin committed, else why should he say, Repent, and repent therefore. Repentance is for sin committed already. And these were such as he loved, too, whom he threatens thus to rebuke and chastise. And does any father rebuke, chastise, or correct his child only from sin and not for sin? Was not Moses a gracious and a holy man? And yet for his unbelief and sin he lost the land of Canaan. Wasn't Samson a good man? And yet by his sin he lost his eyes and his life too. Was not David a gracious and a holy man? And yet for his sin the Lord said the sword should never depart from his house. And yet Christ had made satisfaction for his sin too, as well as then, as for the saints now. But now... Though there be never so much evil in the sins of God's people, yet they have no reason, no just cause or scripture reason to be cast down and be discouraged in that respect. But how may this appear, that notwithstanding the sins of God's own people, that grieve the Spirit of God, and are a dishonor to Jesus Christ, and wound the name of God and the profession of Christ so much, that yet the saints have no reason to be discouraged or cast down, number one. They know, or they may know, that they shall never be condemned for their sin, whatever it be. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, saith the Apostle. Christ has made sin for them, and if Christ be made sin for me, then my sin shall never hurt me. Christ has made sin for saints, therefore their sin shall not hurt them. It stands not with the justice of God to exact a payment of one debt twice. Now the Lord Jesus Christ has not only been arrested, but in jail for the debt of the saints and people of God. And he has paid it to the utmost farthing. He has paid it better than they could have paid it themselves, if they had gone to hell. For if a godly man had gone to hell and been damned forever, 
it would have always been pain, but the debt would never have been paid. Christ paid it all down for the present. And if you look into scripture, you will find that the Lord does not condemn a man, no, not a wicked man, barely for the act of his former sin, but because he will not turn from it. Psalm 711, the Lord is angry with the wicked every day. Verse 12, if he turn not, he will wet his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He has prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordained his arrows against the persecutor. The Lord has prepared instruments of death against every wicked man, but yet notwithstanding. Though a man be never so wicked, if he turn to the Lord, God will not discharge those instruments of death upon him, yea, though his sins have been never so great. But the text says, if he turn not, not because he has sinned before, only because he doesn't turn from his sin, he will wet his sword, he has bent his bow and made it ready. Now there is always in the saints and people of God a turning disposition. Although they do sin against God, there is always, I say, a turning disposition in them. And therefore the Lord will not discharge the instruments of death upon them. Surely then they have no reason to be quite discouraged in this respect. Number two. As godly men shall never be condemned for their sins, so their sins shall never part God and them. What is the seeming reason why some are so discouraged about their sins, but because they think they shall not only lose the face and presence of God by their sins, but that they shall lose God himself? But now I say, the sins of the godly shall never part God in them. Their sins may hide God's face, but as their sins did not hinder God in their coming together at first, so their sins shall never part God in them. Their sins may cause a strangeness between God and them, but shall never cause an enmity. Their sins may hide God's face from them, but shall never turn God's back upon them. Those whom God loves, he loves to the end. I am the Lord that changes not, he says. And as the prophet Isaiah speaks, as a covenant that the Lord made with Noah, such is the covenant that he makes with his people. Now look into Genesis chapter 8. And you shall see what the covenant is that the Lord made there with Noah and with the world by Noah. When Noah came out of the ark, he built an altar and sacrificed, verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground for man's sake. Why? For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. You would think this were a reason why God should curse the ground again. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Man is wicked, therefore surely God will curse the ground again. No, says the Lord, but though you that are poor creatures think so, yet I am that God of all grace. I make this covenant with the world by Noah, that I will not curse the ground any more for man's sake, because the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth continually. I confess indeed the Hebrew signifies although, because, and it may be so translated, although the imagination of man's heart is evil, yet the Chaldi paraphrase and Septuagint render it because, but though it be so translated, yet that is enough to make good the truth and doctrine which I urge from this scripture. The covenant that the Lord makes with this people is such a covenant as the Lord made with Noah. So, says the prophet Isaiah, what then? Therefore, if God be in covenant with a man, he shall never lie under wrath again. For though the world sin, the world shall never be drowned again. And so, though he does sin, he shall never lie under wrath again. Now, as for the people of God, they are all in covenant with God. They are under this gracious covenant, and therefore, though the mountains may be removed, God's mercy shall never be removed from them. And though the great hills may be thrown into the sea, the people of God, once in covenant with God, shall never be thrown into hell. And tell me then, have you, that are the people of God, any just cause or reason to be cast down or to be discouraged? Number three, if the very sins of God's people, through the overruling hand of grace shall be an occasion of more grace and comfort to them than ever they had in all their lives before. 
then surely they have no reason to be discouraged in this respect. Now mark it, and you shall find that God does never allow his people to fall into any sin, but he intends to make that sin an inlet into further grace and comfort to them. This you see in the first great sin that ever was committed by the children of men, the fall of Adam. The Lord himself came and preached the gospel, preached Christ and the fallen man. And surely when God himself preached the gospel, we are to think the man was converted. Now the greatest blessing that ever the world saw was the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But how came that about? God allows man to fall, and man's unrighteousness must usher in Christ's righteousness. The scripture tells us that the Lord allowed Hezekiah to fall, that Hezekiah might know all that was in his heart. He did not know his own heart before, and therefore the Lord let him fall that he might know his own heart. But if you look into the Romans, chapter 11, you shall find in so many words what I am now speaking of, verse 32. For God has concluded them all in unbelief. Why? That he might have mercy upon all. Oh, what a blessed design upon unbelief is here. Therefore God concludes all under unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Sin gets not, but is a loser by every fall of the godly. And if you look into the scripture, you shall observe that when the people of God fall, usually they fail in that grace in which they do most excel, and in which they did most excel. Therein they did most miscarry. Abraham did most excel in faith, and therein he did most miscarry. Moses did most excel in meekness, and therein did he most miscarry. We read of no other sin concerning Moses but his anger. Job did most excel in patience, but in this he most miscarried. Peter did most excel in zeal and resolution for Christ, though all the world forsake you, I will not. And therein he did most miscarry, denying Christ at the voice of a damsel. I say, you shall observe this, that the saints fell and failed in that grace in which they did most excel. And they did most excel in that they did most miscarry. What is the reason of this? But because the Lord, by the overruling hand of his grace, did make their very miscarriages, inlets, and occasions to their further grace and holiness. God has a great revenue from the very infirmities of his people. He never does allow any of his people to fall into any sin, but he has a design by that fall to break the back of that sin that they fall into. Now then, have the saints and people of God any reason to be discouraged in this respect? By their sin they may be and are oftentimes suspended from their comforts and use of their privileges, but by their sin they do not lose their right to it. You know how it was with the leper in the times of the Old Testament among the Jews, when he was carried out of the city or town from his own house by reason of his uncleanness. Or now, if a man that has a plague and be carried from his own house by reason of it, the leper then and the man that has a plague or the pest now may say, Though I be removed from mine own house and have not the use of my house, yet I have a right to my house still, and though I cannot come to the use of my land, yet I have a right to the land still. So a godly man may say is concerning a sin. This sin of mine indeed it is a pest, and a plague of my soul, and a leprosy. But though by this leprosy of mine I am now suspended from the use of my comforts, yea, from the full use of my interest in Jesus Christ, yet notwithstanding I have an interest in Christ still, I have not lost my interest, Still I have right to Christ, although I cannot come to the use of him as I did before. Yet I have a right to Jesus Christ now, as I had before. And if all these things be so, why should a godly man be cast down or discouraged in this respect? Surely he ought not to be so. But suppose a man's sins be such as never were pardoned before. And truly that is my case. For I have sinned a great sin. And I do not read in all the word of God any example that ever such a sin as mine was pardoned. Have I not reason now to be quite discouraged and cast down? 
I answer, no. For, I pray, what do you think of Adam? Adam sinned a great sin in our first fall. The Lord himself came and preached the gospel to him. The seed of the woman shall break the serpent's head. Should Adam have said, Oh, but there is no hope for me, for I have no example or precedent of pardon. Adam could have no example of any that was pardoned before him because he was the first man, and the first that sinned. Should he have sat down and been discouraged because he could not find any example for the pardon of the like sin that he had committed? You know what our Savior Christ said, Every sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unless it be the sin against the Holy Ghost. Every sin, though it be boiled up to blasphemy, you say you have no example for the pardon of such a sin as yours is. But does not your sin come within the compass of these words? Every sin and blasphemy... Surely it does. Have you any reason then to be discouraged under the power of this objection? But suppose that a man has sinned greatly against his conscience or against his light, against his knowledge. Has he not just cause or reason then to be cast down and to be quite discouraged? No. For if there be a sacrifice for such a sin as this is, then a man has no reason to be quite discouraged, cause to be humbled, as you shall hear afterward, but no reason to be discouraged. Now in the times of the Old Testament, in times of the law among the Jews, there was a sacrifice not only for sin committed ignorantly, but also for sin committed against light and against conscience. And I appeal to you, whoever you are that make this objection, do you not think that Peter, when he denied his Lord and Master, sinned against his conscience? against his light and against his knowledge? Surely then there is no reason that a man should be quite discouraged, no, not in this respect. But suppose that a man's sins be exceeding great, gross, and heinous, for I do confess that possibly a godly man may sin some sin against his light and against his conscience sometimes. But as for me, my sin is exceeding great, gross, and heinous. And have I not just cause and reason now to be discouraged? No, not yet. For though your sin be great, is not God's mercy great, exceeding great? Is not the satisfaction of Christ great? Are the merits of Christ's blood small? Is not God, the great God of heaven and earth, able to do great things? You grant that God is almighty in providing for you. And is he not almighty also in pardoning? Will you spoil God of his almightiness and pardoning? You say your sin is great, but is it infinite? Is there any more infinities than one, and that is God? Is your sin as big as God, as big as Christ? Is Jesus Christ only a mediator for small sins? Will you bring down the satisfaction of Christ and the mercy of God to your own model? Has not the Lord said concerning pardoning mercy that his thoughts are not as our thoughts, but as the heavens are greater than the earth? So are his thoughts in this respect beyond our thoughts. Has not the Lord said in Isaiah 43 to the people of the Jews at verse 22, But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel, verse 23. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offering, neither have you honored me with your sacrifices. Verse 24. Thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of your sacrifice. But you have made me to serve with your sins, you have wearied me with your iniquity. Yet, verse 25. I, even I, am he that blots out your transgression for my own sake. It will not remember your sins. Here are sins and great sins. And if the Lord will therefore pardon sin because it is great to his people, then surely they have no reason to be quite discouraged in this respect. Now look what David says in Psalm 25:11: For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. Mark his argument. Pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. If David used this reason, then may you also, 
And if this be a reason why God should pardon sin because it is great, then this cannot be a reason, a just reason, why you should be discouraged. But suppose that a man's sin be the sin of revolting, declining, for this is my case. Some will say, I have striven and striven against my sin a long while, and yet I return to it again. Times were before this that I have been exceeding forward and ready to what is good, but now I am much declined, abated, and even gone backward, with revolting and deep revolting, and I have lain long so, even for many years. Don't I have a reason, and a just reason now, to be discouraged and cast down within myself? I answer, no, not yet. For though this be a sufficient cause of great humiliation, for backsliding in scripture phrase is called rebellion, and rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Yet a good man has no reason to be discouraged in this regard, for the Lord says in Jeremiah 3, 1, They say, If a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, shall he return to her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. In verse 12, Return you backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. And again in verse 14, Turn, O backsliding children, for I am married to you. And if ever the Lord Jesus Christ did betroth himself to any soul, he will never put that soul away again. I hate putting away, saith God. Men put away their wives among the Jews, but the Lord says, I hate putting away. And in Isaiah, thus saith the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it, to whom I have sold you? Among the Jews, a husband put away his wife upon small occasions. As for adultery, you know, that was death. He did not put away his wife upon adultery, she was to die for it. But the husbands put away their wives upon other occasions. And when they put away their wives, they gave the wife a bill of divorce. That so upon all occasions a woman might show by this that she was free from such a man. Now, says the Lord, you that charge me and complain that I have put you away, come and show me the bill of divorce. Thus saith the Lord, where is the bill? And, poor soul, you complain that I have put you away. Come then and show me the bill of divorce. Let any one who complains that I have put him away and cast him off. Come and bring out his bill of divorce. This you cannot do. Men indeed put away, but if ever the Lord Christ does match himself to you, he will never put you away again. And whereas you say that you are declined and have much revolted, and so have continued even many years, consider whether you be not mistaken. Every abatement and affection is not a declining in grace. Possibly we may not grieve for sin afterwards so much as at our first conversion, yet we may hate it more. At first you may pray more against it, yet afterward watch more against it. We never see the face of sin so ugly as in the mirror of God's free love. And do you not see the free love of God more? Possibly your affections might be higher at the first, but is not your conviction more clear and full? As affections dry up, so we grow more settled in our judgment. And if your judgment be more settled, you are not declined, though your affections be somewhat abated. And whereas you say that you have returned to your sin again and again, and have continued under your revolt for many years, I shall only tell you what Mr. Bilney, a blessed martyr, once said, hearing a minister preach very terribly against sin, and saying thus, Behold, you old sinner, you have lain rotting in the grave of your sin these threescore years, and do you now think to go to heaven in one year? Do you think to go forward to heaven more in one year than you have gone backward to hell these threescore years? Ah, said Mr. Bilney, here is goodly preaching of repentance in the name of Christ. Had I heard such doctrine preached before this, my poor soul had despaired forever. But he says, the Lord Christ died for sinners, young sinners and old sinners, 
for one as well as the other, such as have lain long in sin, as well as those that have lain but a little while in sin, if they will come home to Christ. And you know what our Savior says, If your brother transgress against you, forgive him. But, Lord, he has transgressed against me not once, and I have forgiven him. Yet saith our Lord, forgive him again. Oh, but, Lord, I have forgiven him again and again, and yet he returns to his fault again. Then forgive him again, saith Christ. But, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother? Our Savior says, If he sin against you seventy times seven, and says he repents, forgive him oft. And now shall the Lord Jesus Christ enjoin us to forgive our brother if he sin against us seventy-seven times? And will not the Lord Christ forgive much more if a poor soul returns to him and say, Lord, I repent me that I have sinned against you? Will the Lord Christ command me, a poor sinner, to forgive so many times? How often will the great God forgive? And have I any reason then to be discouraged in this respect? Surely you have not. But suppose that a man has sinned foully, greatly, and he cannot repent or be humbled enough, for that is my case. I have sinned. I have sinned greatly. And now, after all, my heart is hard, and I cannot be humbled enough. Oh, I cannot repent enough. Has he not just cause and reason for his discouragement now, yea, now, to be quite discouraged? No, not yet. For what if the Lord will have your humiliation from you by degrees? Should you be so, or so much humbled for the present? It may be it would be with you as it has been with others. You would never think of your sin afterward. But maybe the Lord will have this work of humiliation to stay long upon your soul, and he will not give it you all at once. Some there are that when they come into a house they pay a great income and little rent. Others pay a little income and a great rent. So it is with souls that come to Christ. Some of the first lay down a great humiliation, and they have lesser of it afterward. Some have less at the first, and have more afterwards by continuance in it. And what now if the Lord will lead your soul in this latter way? This latter way may be the better way if the Lord think it's fit. Again, it may be that if you had so much, or so much humiliation now at the first, you would think that in and by and for your humiliation you had, should have acceptance with God and the remission of your sin. If you be kept off from this rock and danger by your lack of that degree of humiliation, which you would have, and so be trained up to prize the Lord's free grace and given you humiliation, have you any cause to complain? Again, if you had so much or so much humiliation for the present, it may be then you would have the less humility. A little humility is as good as a great deal of humiliation, as good being humble as being humbled. Now because you are not humble, therefore your soul is kept humble. Had you many tears and abundance of tears, maybe then you would be proud. But the Lord denies you tears, and you are not humble to the degree of your own desires. And so the Lord keeps you humble by the lack of your humiliation. Again, it may be that you were humble so, or so much at the present, or at the first, you would have the less fear of your own heart. The more humble it may be, the less after fear. And the less humble, the more after fear. The less humbled sometimes, the more a man fears his own heart and his own condition. Gracious fear is as good as humiliation. And if that what you lack in humiliation, you have made up for it in fear. Have you reason to be discouraged? I know it is usual with Satan to say to the people of God at the first coming to Christ that they are not humbled enough, and so keeps them off from mercy and grace. But I pray, tell me, can you ever be humbled enough? Can there be any proportion between your sins and your humiliation? The truth is, we should labor that our humiliation be answerable to our sin. But God is not pleased with grief for grief. God is not pleased with sorrow for sorrow. The end of all our sorrow and grief is to embitter our sin to us, to make us to prize Jesus Christ, to wean us from the delights and pleasures of the creature, to discover the deceitfulness and naughtiness of our own hearts. 
in scripture phrase and language of the New Testament. Repentance is called an after-wisdom, an after-mind, a bethinking of oneself. It is called a conviction. Now, though you are not humbled to the degree which you desire, yet notwithstanding, do you not bethink yourself? Are you not convinced of the evil of your former way? Has not the Lord now given you an after-wisdom? And do not you say concerning your sin, Oh, if it were to do it again, I would not do it for all the world. So it is with the servants and people of God. Though they cannot be humbled so much as they would be, yet notwithstanding they are thus far humbled, so far grieved that their sins are embittered, and themselves by this wean from the delights and pleasures of the world, convinced of the evil of their sin, and what they lack in humiliation they have it in humility. The less humbled, the more they are kept humble, and what they do lack at the first they have it afterwards by degrees soaking into their souls. Have they in this any reason to be discouraged in these respects? Surely not.